Yes. Hey. Thank you and welcome to the show this morning. The topic this morning is conspiracy theories and their explanation. And we're fortunate to have Alana McLaughlin with us to talk about uh, some of the conspiracy theories that she believed to be prominent among many people and uh, to give some rationale in terms of why we should be concerned with the various kinds of conspiracy theories that she's talking about. And of course, Alana, let me welcome you to the show uh, this morning and to uh, start us off by giving us some information about your background, your education and some of your experiences. You've been with us a number of times and I'm sure that all of that information is quite familiar to some of our audience, but some of them might not know. So let's do it from that perspective. Well, as you've already stated, my name is Alana McLaughlin. I am 11 years old. I was born August 27, 2002, and I am currently in sixth grade at John Early Museum Magnet Middle School. <coughs> Um, I've gone to many schools for elementary schools, such as uh, Napier, Alex Green, Robert Churchwell Museum Magnet School. And um, for middle school, I'm just going straight through John Early because it's also the pathway to Hume Fogg Academic High School, which is where I want to go. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'm very, I'm heavily involved in many activities after church, um, after, you know, out of school, such as my church and other organizations that I can help out with. And actually, uh, recently I was nominated to attend the Junior National Young Leaders Conference in Washington, D.C. Uh, in the summer of 2014 in June. And so, yes, I will be attending that for a week in Washington where um, people high up in power will be uh, leading me and groups of other children around Washington so that we can experience it as our living classroom. Um, a few more experiences about me. Um, I all, Recently, actually, I, I preached at uh, Mount Olive Missionary Baptist Church uh, for their Love and the Unity of Family program. And so, yes, I try to get involved in everything I can because I think that is my calling. No, no, I, I, I guess... Uh people would probably wonder why in the world we would want to talk about uh, conspiracies and uh, how do you explain some of the conspiracies that we're dealing with. But what's your rationale in terms of dealing with this? And why don't you think in terms of uh, the greatest conspiracy you know of, and that will give our audience an idea as to how far we think that we might be able to go in reference to dealing with these conspiracies. Talk about the greatest conspiracy that you know and some explanation in terms of that and then we'll be able to sort of del delve into various conspiracies. Well really why I chose to talk about conspiracy theories today is <clears throat> recently uh, my encore class we were talking and then my encore teacher starts talking about conspiracy theories and how um, one night in that week, he uh, watched a video <coughs> about how the moon, the man on the moon was staged, and that's actually the first conspiracy I want to talk about, because I think in my mind is the most famous, because this is a little known fact, 40% of Americans, only 40% do not believe that this happened, and that, that is a pretty great percentage, I mean 40% of Americans, you'd think that, well like 10% believe it didn't happen, but 40%? Don't so, believe that a man won't Don't up. believe uh -huh. that it happened. And so I think that's a pretty big percentage. And so also, the man on the moon. So I watched a YouTube video and I've gone on various blogs and websites and even read official statements from NASA. And a lot of this didn't make sense to me. One thing is that, so I was going through pictures of Neil Armstrong on the moon and then I saw, I saw something that made no sense to me. You, okay, so there's no gravity on the moon. 
the American flag was waving, but there's no gravity on the moon. How would it wave? And also, the craters on the moon look eerily similar to the ones in Area 51, a place where nobody can go unless they're working there without getting shot down without a warning. Now, why would they block off this place to everybody, but just everything normal is going on there? Is there something they're trying to hide from us? And, um, another reason why I think, well, I don't personally think that this never happened, but one reason why people think that this never happened is because uh, I guess it was a few days before Neil Armstrong actually went on the moon. He uh, flew a tester um, spaceship, which was six times smaller than the actual one he took up into space. He crashed that one, and he had to um, eject because right after it crashed, it bl blew up. But then a few days later, in that same week, he beautifully flew a spaceship up to the moon. But he couldn't take this one in Area 51 up to the sky without making it explode. And so, Lana, uh, these are some of the conspiracies that you believe that our audience ought to be concerned about, and you trying to give some kind of explanation to them as to why they are conspiracies. And from what I understand, you've got a whole bag full of uh, various conspiracies <laughs> that uh, somehow you've convinced me that we ought to talk about today on this show. And I think that you're doing a good job so far, and we're going to take our first commercial break, and we'll be back with our audience following this very, very short commercial break. Thank you and welcome back to the second segment of the show for, the, for today. We're talking to Alana McLaughlin and she's dealing with conspiracies and how she has some information in reference to how all of these conspiracies came about. And during the first segment, she gave us quite a bit of information. And so Alana, during the second segment, segment let's see if we can uh, continue our discussion in reference to conspiracies. And actually, before I start, I want to give, um, I want to have a quick saying to our viewers that these are not my personal views that I'm disclosing today. This stuff is the stuff that I found on the internet, that I found on blogs. This is not my personal subject. I'm not saying that, um, that Neil Armstrong never touched the moon. I'm not saying that so-and-so did this or so-and-so. This is stuff that I've personally seen. Just for our information. Just for your information. This is not my personal views. Now, um, I want to go into uh, famous conspiracy theories in pop culture, like uh, artists and music. Now, I think another famous conspiracy theory that a lot of people don't know about is the Tupac conspiracy theory. Now, as you know, Tupac was a very famous rapper at the time of his death. He was murdered. And so, basically, after he was murdered, he... he um, Albums kept being released under his name and songs kept being released after his death. And a lot of people don't believe that he pre-recorded those many songs. And a lot of people still do think that he's in Albuquerque, New Mexico, still recording songs to release in future albums and making money off of it um, because he wanted to use this murder as a pub pub publicity stunt so that he would make more money because, you know, people would be grieving his death and they would buy more albums and get their friends to buy more albums and he would release more songs, making more albums. That's a, that's a, that's a conspiracy in reference to you believe that uh, a large number of folks believe that. Yes. Mm. And uh, another one is that Shakespeare wasn't Shakespeare. Now, um, <laughs> yeah, I know this makes uh, no sense at all. Well, a lot of people believe that the man who wrote all these books like Romeo and Juliet wasn't who we think to be Shakespeare of Stratford. They think it was William Stanley or Francis Bacon because due to a lot of missing stuff about, you know, biographical information about him like birth date or burial date, a lot of people don't really believe he existed and they think that Shakespeare was a, a pseudonym that um, many authors use, like Carolyn Keene, who wrote Nancy Drew. Mm -hmm. It was actually a group of people who used Carolyn Keene as a name to keep their identity sacred. Now, another one is uh, Jack the Ripper. Jack the Ripper was a uh, famous uh, serial uh, killer back uh, in, I guess, like a really long time ago. 
And so Jack the Ripper would slay girls. He would slit their throats. Um, he would find prostitutes on the street and just murder them and leave their body parts scoured up and down the streets. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people think that Vincent Van Gogh was, quote unquote, Jack the Ripper. And they think this because a lot of Van Gogh's work represents the outline of some of Jack the Ripper's body parts that he skewered across the streets. Like, for instance, a leg, a leg that he severed off of a woman, well, Jack the Ripper severed off of a woman, was featured in one of Van Gogh's paintings. Mm -hmm. Like, the outline of the leg was featured in a background of the painting. So a lot of people think that this is really weird. And there are also books on it. It's the same thing with Tupac. Mm -hmm. And even Elvis Presley, the same thing as Tupac. After he did, he kept releasing songs. If people don't think he pre-recorded these songs, they think he's still alive to this day. Now, um, another one in the music industry is Kurt Cobain. If you're not familiar with mm -hmm. Kurt Cobain, he was the lead singer of the band Nirvana. He uh, shot himself in the head and killed himself. Now, a lot of people think that his, uh, that his then girlfriend, Courtney Love, murdered him so that she could inherit his money and uh, take over all the rights to all Nirvana's songs and famous albums like Nevermind or In Utero. <laughs> And so they think that she murdered him so that she can claim all his money because he was very rich at the time and he was famous and he still is to this day. And so a lot of people think that he was murdered by his girlfriend and that the FBI and the CIA covered it up. Go on. And then now I want to talk about even more famous ones. Like in the previous sips, in the previous uh, segment, if you're, not, if you're just tuning in, I talked about uh, the man on the moon and how there were a lot of evidence saying that, you know, he didn't really land on the moon. Like, um, there were no stars in the sky in the pictures that were taken of Neil Armstrong on the moon. The American flag was waving and there's no gravity on the moon. Um, he uh, crashed um, a mini spaceship that he was trying to fly, but then he uh, flew one six times, at, six times harder to drive into space and landed on the moon gracefully, but then he crashed one and made it explode just days before. And so those are some of the ones that in pop culture, and now there are other ones like um, Pan Am Flight 103. If you're not familiar with that, on December 21st, 1988, Flight 103 exploded over Lockerbie, Scotland, killing everyone on board and 11 residents of the town. Although Libya has recently claimed responsibility for the attack, of all the items on this list, Flight 103 has probably been responsible for spawning the greatest number of conspiracy theories. Some people say that the CIA started. Some people say that's, um, that Libya started. Some people say that, you know, it was hijacked by terrorists. And so nobody really knows what really happened because everybody on there was killed. But then, so a lot of people say that, hey, it was the FBI, or hey, it was the CIA, or hey, maybe it was America. Maybe people on that flight knew a little too much about the FBI and that they wanted to keep them quiet. And that leads me on to my next subject, the, um, the Twin Towers conspiracy. I read a conspiracy theory about 9-11, uh, September 11, 2001, which said that, um, that the Twin Towers were blown up because certain people inside the Twin Towers were investigating old files and old cases involving the FBI and the CIA and the President of the United States. And so they were investigating that and they had gotten a, a quote unquote a little too close to the truth about what the FBI is doing to people, about brainwashing techniques that they've been studying and that they've been practicing on poor people. And so when the, ten tw when the people in the Twin Towers buildings were about to disclose this information, boom, two, um, two planes flew into those buildings. And so a lot of people think that those planes didn't just fly into those. They think that it was set up by the FBI and terrorists was just thrown all over it because they didn't want the FBI to be in trouble for this. And also another one, um, I think a really famous one that I know of is... Um, the one, uh, JFK's assassination, and so that talks about um, how Lee Harvey Oswald could have had two accomplices or how his brain was removed during the autopsy and kept as a souvenir or that he never really died. And so those are a, a few conspiracies, and so basically I will get more into the JFK one in our next segment. Very good, and of course, Alana, let me uh, simply say that uh, it's, uh, it's astounding to me in terms of uh, having uh, understood that you were going to talk about these various conspiracies and to somehow believe that uh, somehow you could carry this through. And I think that you're doing an excellent job. 
in terms of carrying it <laughs> through because I really don't know, have anything to say in reference to it. Because these theories are more popular than you would believe, really. Yeah, well, I think that you're demonstrating that. And of course, we'll be back with our audience following this very, very short commercial break. Thank you and welcome back to the final segment of the show for today. We're talking to Alana McLaughlin and she's talking about uh, conspiracies and some of the explanations for uh, some of the many conspiracies that uh, she has uh, come across uh, on, through various sources. And so Alana, let's uh, uh, continue our uh, discussion with the various kinds of conspiracies and uh, elaborate up on some of them if you so desire and uh, do whatsoever you will in reference to it because I only thing I can do is just wonder about what in the world you're talking about mm -hmm. in terms of where you got all of this information from. Go on, talk about that. Now if you're just tuning in, um, as Dr. Haney has stated, I am Milan McLaughlin. I'm 11 years old, <laughs> believe it or not, and um, I go, am in sixth grade at John Early Museum Magnet Middle School. Now in the second segment, well in the first segment I talked about my background in education and in the second segment I talked about, I gave a few examples of some famous conspiracy theories, the Tupac conspiracy theory and I also led on uh, and I gave a little bit about the JFK assassination conspiracy theory. Now I'm going to elaborate more on that right now. The JFK assassination uh, conspiracy theory, there are thousands of conspiracy theories that around the world, but I narrowed down to my uh, to two that really made me go, wow. The first one was that Lee Harvey Oswald, the man who assassinated John F. Kennedy, the president, or the former president, um, he had two accomplices. We had two more accomplices. Now, this is saying that there were three people, including Lee Harvey Oswald and two other unknown people, and that the, uh, the FBI only disclosed Lee Harvey Oswald's identity, and then they took him into confinement, and then they took the other two accomplices and tortured them until their death in re in, to avenge uh, JFK's death and in revenge to uh, Lee Harvey Oswald, because these were Lee Harvey Oswald's brothers, and in some cases I've heard that these were his best friends or his former classmates from high school. But uh, in the most famous one, I've heard that these were his brothers that he had that they that he used to be uh, to kill John F. Kennedy. And now the second one was that during John F. Kennedy's autopsy, his his brain was removed from his head. Hmm. Now uh, the story goes, well, the conspiracy goes that John F. Kennedy um, during his autopsy they sawed the top of his head off and then they uh, they looked at his brain because they wanted to investigate his brain to see um, if, if A they could bring him back to life or if B how he could be so smart so cunning mm -hmm. and so they investigated uh, things in his brain they tried different things di different potions on his brain and finally the doctors who performed his autopsy keep his brain as a souvenir of their most famous autopsy and they keep it in a, uh, in a little room inside a hidden hospital or in some cases I've heard that they hide inside Area 51, another reason why nobody can really go in there. Now a second very famous um, conspiracy theory that I've heard of is the Pearl Harbor conspiracy theory. Now although for most of us it was a surprise, the, conspiracy, the, the theory goes that it wasn't really a surprise for a select few, including President Roosevelt. This is a Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, yeah, Pearl Harbor. in December the, of 1941. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, President Roosevelt, who, who having advocated for war against Germany, finally found his opportunity. Of note, proponents often point out that none of the Navy's three Pacific aircraft carriers were in port that day. Now, if the Navy's uh, three Pacific aircraft carriers weren't in port, were in port that day, why would they all, why would three of them be in port that day? What sense does that make? And so they think that President Roosevelt just really wanted a good reason to start the war on Germany. So he said, hey, they started Pearl Harbor, let's start the war. Because people think that A, the FBI planned it um, in a, 
some people think that it was a surprise for Roosevelt and that the FBI planned it as a gift to him so he could finally start that war on Germany. And some people say that he planned it so he could start the war on Germany. But in every instance that I've come about, it all talks about how he wanted to start the war on Germany. And another thing, and I also talked about in a previous subject, um, the Shakespeare one, and how a lot of people think that Shakespeare didn't write his books like A Midsummer Night's Dream or Romeo and Juliet, and they think it, um, his stories were written by William Stanley or Francis Bacon. Now, another one, another very famous conspiracy theory that is actually really recent is the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting conspiracy theory. Now, um, one day I was scrolling throughout YouTube and then I, I, and I was, and I came across this video and it said proof that Sandy Hook was a hoax. And I'm sitting here like, why would anybody say this was a hoax? And so me being half in anger and half in disbelief that somebody would take the death of children and make it into a hoax, I watched the video. And honestly, I saw some information that blew my mind. Like um, one man who was interviewed about seeing dead children strewn across his driveway because he lived right next to the school, him and, him and three other people who were interviewed about Sandy Hook were all part of a Screen Actors Guild. And also, there's one picture of children walking out of the school with their teacher crying, and then, only a few more students were killed in that Santa Hicks Elementary School. There were supposedly from 200 to 300 um, children that were in the school that day. Um, and I guess somewhere around 12 to 15 of them were photographed. And I know that over 100 children, and I personally, I don't remember hearing about 100 to 200 children being killed in Sandy Hook. So what happened to the rest of the children? Because there were supposedly 200 to 300 in the school that day, from what I've seen, um, on different websites, and I may be wrong. And then only about 12 to 15 of them were photographed all in that line walking out with their teacher. That photograph has been made viral. And the rest of them were quote unquote killed. Um, I didn't. I don't remember hearing about 100 to 200 children being killed, and, but what happened? So if those children weren't killed, what happened to them? I mean, so I know some children could have been absent that day, thank God, and um, some children could have been sick that day, but there were still uh, somewhere around 100 to 130, 40 children that were there, and if they weren't killed, what happened to them? Because they weren't photographed or recorded coming out of the school, if they stayed in the school, how, how were there that many children inside the school? Lana, after all of these conspiracies that you've talked about, uh, do many people believe in some of the, the conspiracies that you're talking about? Is, that, is, is it a widely held thing of people believe in a large number of intelligent people believe in some of these conspiracies? Uh, yeah, like um, I was reading a Time Magazine article this morning talking about how the FBI has been trying substances on African Americans, making us so prone to STDs or HIVs. And a lot of people believe in stuff like um, Time Magazine, well, no, the University of Chicago took a poll um, asking 1,342 people um, their beliefs on if the government tries things on us, like brainwashing techniques, and we don't know about it, 39% of people said yes. 40% of people believe that we never landed on the moon, and the rest of the theories that I've talked about weren't polled, but I mean, these were stuff that I've gone on previous pages and all the stuff that I've named, I've seen on blogs and stuff and all in the same videos. And I'm just thinking, wow, this stuff is really popular. And uh, I've heard of all of these before, but only this time have I really taken the time out to really search and dig and dig into them. And I just really, it blew my mind how 40% how of Americans believe that we never touched the moon. 40%, that is a very big population in my opinion. And so there's a, there's a real conspiracy uh, in terms of the belief that people have in uh, conspiracies and et cetera. And so you think that a large number of folks uh, just simply disbelieve some of the things that uh, might be apparent or obvious to everybody else that they just don't believe it is. is and I'm not really uh, one for conspiracy theories. I, I mean, they, I find them interesting. I find it interesting how people's minds can make up these elaborate things that the government is trying to kill us all or that Chernobyl was planned. And uh, so, yeah, I just, I think this is really interesting. 
because you know, um, reading about 9-11, I never thought that this was started by the government. I've just I read about it and I said, wow, terrorists really did this to us. And talking about the Tupac murder, I mean, I never thought twice about it. I mean, I wasn't born to see it because I wasn't alive in the 90s, but I just look at it and I'm like, wow, this, I just thought he was killed. I never thought that he was still alive or that the government started it. And because in every case that I've seen, except the Shakespeare one and the Jack the Ripper one, it was started by the government. Pearl Harbor started by the government. Okay, Lana, let me uh, thank you for coming by and giving us that excellent information in reference to uh, some of the uh, major conspiracies and how prone so many folks are to believe in these conspiracies. And I appreciate you indicating that these were some of the conspiracies that you know, but not your necessarily your beliefs and et cetera. But uh, I want to thank you for that uh, information. And let me encourage our audience to tune in again next week for another informative edition of Comments. Thank you and good morning.
you call it. You, 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 you call it. Thank you and welcome to the show this morning. The topic this morning is preventing overweight babies. And we're fortunate to have with us to talk about uh, preventing overweight babies, uh, Dr. Flora Ucoli, uh, who is from Meharry Medical College. And she has quite a bit of information in reference to not only preventing overweight babies, but obesity in children and similar kinds of information. But before we get started, Dr. Okoli, let's see if we can give, have you to give us some information about your background, your education, and your experiences, and some of the things that were important in terms of eventually bringing you to us this morning. And then we'll get into other topics. Thank you, Dr. Haney. I went to high school in Nigeria. Uh, I was in a boarding school. It was an Anglican girls boarding school. And in that school, I was able to take part in athletics, basketball, hockey, you do whatever you want to do. Mm -hmm. And I was a very good sports girl, but at the same time, I was good in class. Mm -hmm. But I thought I wanted to be a sports teacher. Mm -hmm. Actually, at one time, I thought I wanted to be a dancer. <laughs> but I know my teacher then was saying, well, you know, dancing, sometimes you might not get a job. Mm -hmm. I think you should think of something else where you can get a job. So I said, okay, I'll be a maths teacher. So I was thinking of becoming a maths teacher. Mm -hmm. But when it came to the time for us to apply to colleges, my father started talking about medicine. Mm -hmm. And I was like, no, I don't like medicine. It's sick people, blood. Uh, no, I don't want medicine. But he kept saying, well, you know, you're a girl. Girls don't do engineering. Girls don't do stuff like, girls do nursing or medicine. Mm -hmm. And he was talking me into it, but at the end, when I was applying to college, I applied to three colleges. So I applied to one for medicine, the second one for mathematics, and the third one for engineering. But uh, at a point in time when the letters of admission began to show up, my father showed me the one from the medical school. And I was admitted, and I was happy, and I didn't even ask about the other ones, and I went to medical school. So I had my initial medical training in Nigeria. And in Nigeria, we run the British system, which means you go to medical school straight from high school. So I was about 18 when I went into 
medical school. No college, then medical school no, directly? No, you go straight into mm -hmm. medical school and you spend six years. Mm -hmm. If you didn't have advanced level, mm -hmm. advanced high school, but mm -hmm. if you had ordinary level, five mm -hmm. years of high school, then you have six years in the university. Mm -hmm. So I had five years in college because I already had two years of post-secondary education. Mm -hmm. So then I was doing medicine like everybody else. And in Nigeria, medical school is two years preclinical and then three years clinical. And when you finish and you have your medical degree, you're going to go into junior residency. Junior residency means you're going to rotate through all the major specialties as a little doctor working under supervision. And during that time, you go through surgery, internal medicine, pediatrics, and OBGYN. And at that time, I began to realize that medicine was not a joke. Mm -hmm. If you're going to be in medicine, mm -hmm. you'll be awake all night. Mm -hmm. People give birth to babies at night. Mm -hmm. People fall ill at night, and they'll call you, and they'll wake you up. And I started to look for the easy way out. And I realized that there was something called public health. Uh, in Nigeria, we, have, we call it public health. We call it community medicine. And I decided to go into community medicine because that is the specialty where you prevent things from happening. And I was thinking that if people can prevent all these things, why do they wait until they fall ill? <laughs> so I became, I went into preventive medicine. So by 1979, I think, I went to Glasgow in Scotland and I had my master's degree in public health. So my medical degree is from Nigeria my public health degree is from Glasgow. Mm -hmm. And then I came back to Nigeria and I was involved in numerous World Health Organization programs that have to do with prevention. For example, I was involved in the expanded program of immunization where we had to try and immunize all children mm -hmm. against the six deadly childhood diseases. Mm -hmm. That's measles and whooping cough and stuff like that. So I was doing that. I was also a director, program director for what we call a primary health care program. Primary health care is supposed to be a program where everybody sees a primary health care doctor and you cannot go to a specialist unless you're referred. So we have these little clinics in villages, we have little clinics here and there, and I did primary health care for many, many, many years. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, while I was doing all of this, I was doing it in a teaching hospital. Mm -hmm. So I had to teach. Very good, Doc. Let me uh, interrupt here for our first commercial break, yes. and then we'll pick up when we uh, come back. And we'll be back with our audience following this very, very short commercial break. Thank you and welcome back to the second segment of the show for today. We're talking to Dr. Flora Okoli, who is at the Meharry Medical College, and the topic is preventing overweight uh, babies. Uh, Dr. Okoli, uh, we started off by getting some information in reference to your background and experiences and et cetera. Let's pick up at that point and bring yourself to uh, Meharry Medical College, and then we'll get into preventing overweight uh, babies from that perspective during the second So segment. right there in the university in Nigeria, some people from Pittsburgh University wanted to do research looking at blood pressure, hypertension in black people. Mm -hmm and they wanted to compare Nigerians with African-Americans. So that's how I got into research. So they came to my university and I started working with them. And after nine years, they invited me to Pittsburgh University for one year mm -hmm. to do a master's program in epidemiology. Mm -hmm. So that's how I got to the US. Mm -hmm. So I did epidemiology and now I'm doing research, mm -hmm. looking at blood pressure, looking at diet, mm -hmm. looking at all kinds of things that cause problem for people. Mm -hmm. So after the master's program, I worked at Howard University for five years, mm -hmm. and I was running the prostate cancer screening program mm -hmm. and the prostate cancer prevention, dietary mm -hmm. risk factor mm -hmm. prevention program. And I was there for five years. Mm -hmm. And after that, 
I came to Meharry because I was going to come and do the same thing. Mm -hmm. So here at Meharry in Nashville, I've been working on prostate cancer for eight years. Mm -hmm. I'm still working on prostate cancer. I still do prostate cancer education. Mm -hmm. But then I always think of the children mm -hmm. and the babies that I used to work with. Mm -hmm. And here in America, I've noticed, I noticed women don't breastfeed. Mm -hmm. I also noticed that Babies are big. I see babies and I think they are three months old and I'm told that they are one month old. Mm -hmm. I see some babies, I think they are just a whole year old and I hear mm -hmm. that they are three months old. I said, these babies are big. Mm -hmm. So then I started to realize that it's because they were not breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. They were using formula. Mm -hmm. So I decided to write a grant. It was first a pilot grant mm -hmm. and it was funded by Robert Wood Johnson Foundation a little grant to just look at the level of knowledge mm -hmm. among women, mm -hmm. African-American women, about the kinds of food they should be giving to their babies. Mm -hmm. And so with that pilot project, I saw that many women did not realize that sugar, candy, mm -hmm. juice, and whole milk was not really good for babies. Mm -hmm. Most women did not even realize that breast milk was superior to formula. Mm -hmm. They didn't know that. So after the pilot project, I now wrote another grant mm -hmm. and I got funded by the department, well, by the centers mm -hmm. for Medicare and Medicaid services. Mm -hmm. And that program gave me enough money to educate 350 pregnant women mm -hmm. and to talk to them about breastfeeding and to talk to them about how they can prevent their baby from being obese. Mm -hmm. Now, why are we trying to prevent babies from being obese? Mm -hmm. Because everybody likes the bouncing baby boy, mm -hmm. the bouncing round cheek little baby girl. We all like them to be big, mm -hmm. but big babies will grow up to be- Create big, big problems. Big preschool mm -hmm. children. Mm -hmm. They're gonna be big high school children. They're gonna be obese adults. And then all this problem, we have a lot of problems that go with obesity. Mm -hmm. For example, hypertension is one of them. Hypercholesterol, that is high lip cholesterol in the blood, comes from obesity. We have heart disease related to obesity. Mm -hmm. All that will happen in the future if you don't stop obesity mm -hmm. now. But even in the babies, a big baby has problems. One problem is they are not as agile mm -hmm. as a baby that's not big. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't move, move. It, they, they don't roll quickly, they don't move well. And so they have the opportunity of, their milestones are a little bit slower. Mm -hmm. Then you see the big babies, if they are that big, they have acid reflux. Mm -hmm. They do get acid reflux quite easily. And big babies also have a nappy rash more quickly than smaller babies. And they have candida around their neck, mm -hmm. under the folds. and. Uh, the story of sudden infant death syndrome, mm -hmm. we don't know the exact cause of all of that, but it has to do with problem, sleep problem, breathing problem, and this type of things might be higher in children that are a little bit too big for their age. So now I'm not talking about, we know that there are other factors in sudden infant death syndrome. We know that blankets and the or crib, some uh -huh. crib and things like that mm -hmm. can lead to it. But if the baby's a little bit too big, mm -hmm. he's not as agile mm -hmm. as the one that's smaller. So that is why we want to prevent obesity. Mm -hmm. We want to prevent obesity in the baby mm -hmm. for now, and we also want to prevent obesity in the baby to prevent obesity mm -hmm. in the future, which has so many health risks. Mm -hmm. How many, it seems that you're sort of breaking uh, a pathway toward uh, some things people never thought of in, in terms of the size of these babies. Generally, we, when we talk about obesity in children, we get them uh, when they are two or three years old and they're exactly. getting but, but what you're saying is that the very, very fact of the way they are fed has quite a bit to do with it. And you think that yes. breastfeeding has, it has... Oh, yes. Because you see, when a newborn baby does not pick what they want to eat, they don't know what they like. They don't have a choice. They take what they are given. Mm -hmm. And the natural choice is breastfeeding, mm -hmm. breast milk. And I don't know if you've ever tasted breast milk, mm -hmm. but breast milk is bland. Mm -hmm. It's not sweet. 
-hmm. It's not sweet. It's just bland. And light. And, and it's light. Mm -hmm. and, there's, and it's created. Each, mm -hmm. each breast, uh, each mother produces the exact kind of milk that is suitable for, for her For the own baby, baby, because she's been carrying yes. the baby for nine and months. All the immunity, mm -hmm. all the antibodies in the mother are in the milk, and mm -hmm. it's all transferred to that baby. So the immunity that I will give to my own baby might be a little bit different from the immunity another mother will give to her own baby, depending on the infections that mm -hmm. she has come across. Mm -hmm. So the breastfeeding is supposed to be the answer, is the natural food for the baby. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, we have something competing with breast milk, mm -hmm. and that is formula. Mm -hmm. Formula is competing with breast milk, mm -hmm. and formula is advertised, mm -hmm. is aggressively promoted, mm -hmm. is pushed everywhere. In fact, it has been pushed for over a hundred years mm -hmm. to the point where many people have forgotten about that breast, breast milk uh -huh. is superior uh -huh. to formula. Uh -huh. And that is why I decided that this is a program I have to carry out with, with, with a lot of passion because I can see that most women do not know. Okay, very good. Do and Doctor, know. we're going to take our second commercial break. And when we come, <coughs> excuse me, when we come back, we want to give you the uh, final segment to uh, talk about some of the things that you think that we ought to know in reference to preventing uh, highway uh, uh, babies. And, okay. and, and of course, we'll be back with our audience uh, following this very, very short commercial break. Thank you and welcome back to the final segment of the show for today. We're talking to Dr. O'Coli, and she's given us some information about preventing birth weight, high birth weight among babies. And Dr. O'Coli, let me uh, give you an opportunity during this last segment to uh, simply inform the audience in reference to uh, some of the issues uh, dealing with uh, overweight babies and uh, formulas and all of that, all of the kind of things that you think that they ought to know. Uh, in order to have a successful uh, pregnancy as well as uh, a successful uh, birth weight in dealing with babies? So um, I will just say that I'm going to talk about two things. Mm -hmm. The first one is that this program, my program, was developed along the line of the Baby Friendly Hospital Initiative, mm -hmm. which was launched by the World Health Organization in 1990. So it's about 30 years mm -hmm. ago. In that program, they expected the hospitals to take the lead and to encourage women, support women, and give them all they need to breastfeed Speed. and to avoid formula altogether in the first six months of life. That is what they call exclusive. At least the first six the months. The first six months of life is supposed to be exclusive breastfeeding because you don't want to introduce any other thing. You don't want to give the child another taste you don't want them to taste any other thing but breast milk mm -hmm. the first six months. And then the other thing is that the government and society in general was supposed to support women to do that mm -hmm. because you cannot exclusively breastfeed a child if you don't have support. Mm -hmm. And what is the support I'm talking about? One support is you shouldn't be working. You should be at home. Mm -hmm. At least that first six, six months. Six months. But how are you going to be at home if you don't get paid maternity leave. Every single country on earth, except for three countries, including the US, do not give women paid maternity leave. If you, the UK or Germany, France, all these countries, they and give a whole And all of that has year. to do with the health of the child yes. itself, because by, yes. by staying at home and breastfeeding. If the woman the stays at home, home, she can breastfeed fully for the first six months of life. Mm -hmm. But you have to support her mm -hmm. by giving her paid maternity leave. Mm -hmm. So that is important. The second thing is that most people 
have forgotten that the breast was designed for the baby, human milk was designed for human baby, <laughs> and there's no need trying to create a human milk substitute mm -hmm. that will always be substandard. Mm -hmm. For one, it contains the wrong amount of calories, too much calories, that's why the babies blow up. Mm -hmm. Secondly, it allows the baby to eat too much because you're feeding the baby from a bottle mm -hmm. and you are trying to make the baby finish whatever you want the baby to finish. Mm -hmm. But if the child was, if the baby was on the breast, they self-regulate, mm -hmm. they suck and they stop. Mm -hmm. In fact, the breast will produce just the right quantity of milk for the baby. Mm -hmm. But so this program we have, we're trying to educate women, let them understand that their baby comes first. Mm -hmm. We try to explain to them that the best thing they can do for their baby is to stay at home with mm -hmm. the baby. And I know it's difficult, especially if you're not going to be supported. Mm -hmm. So the government needs to think about this. Rather than giving people f formula, mm -hmm. you know, give them paid maternity leave. Now that's, you, you were saying that that would be cost effective yes. <coughs> in the long run because yes. by simply having the mother stay there with the child for at least six months, she will have a healthier child and he will have fewer diseases and et cetera, et cetera. And so in the real sense, yes. <coughs> that is uh, cost effective. Yes. I was actually reading an article that mentioned up to $90 million <coughs> saved, cost saving, you know, in, in cash by just breastfeeding so that it, because if you breastfeed the baby, they have less infection, less ear infection, less respiratory tract infection. They have so many things that will go right for that baby that they don't have to go to hospital all the time. And then you save money if you do that. And then the mother, they will bond with the baby. There's psychological, a lot of psychological benefits mm -hmm. for the baby especially and also for the mother mm -hmm. if they are able to stay together and bond mm -hmm. together. And so this program has been designed in such a way that we encourage women to come and get four education sessions for free. Mm -hmm. We talk to them about obesity in babies and why it is a bad thing. Mm -hmm. We talk to them about breast milk and formula. We compare the two and we encourage them to try and do what we are doing. Knowing fully well that several hospitals do not promote breastfeeding. Oh, yeah. They may pay <clears throat> lip mm -hmm. service to but, they... but in action, there mm -hmm. are certain hospital routines that discourage breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. Take, for example, if you have a baby born right now, you're supposed to put the baby to the mother's breast within 30 minutes mm -hmm. and let the baby suck. That's what you're supposed to do. You're not supposed to take the baby away from the mother. Mm -hmm. And why do we say that? Because if a baby is born, it's kept on the mother's bosom, the baby will find the nipple mm -hmm. and latch by him or herself. That's natural. It's natural. Mm -hmm. And that will send a message to the brain to do what we call the letdown reflex mm -hmm. that will tell the breast that, oh, there's a baby. baby there. And mm -hmm. this <clears throat> will make the woman lactate. Mm -hmm. Like she can hear the baby. She can see the baby beside her. She can smell the baby. Mm -hmm. She can smell the baby. All her senses will be stimulated to make the breast produce mm -hmm. enough milk mm -hmm. for the baby. But if you take the baby away, or if you use too much painkillers on the mother, mm -hmm. those are all the kind of things that will dull the reflex mm -hmm. and the breast will like go in to sleep mm -hmm. and might not produce, produce the something. milk that it was supposed to produce mm -hmm. because it, it, it was not stimulated enough. And also there are some things that people do. When a woman has a baby today, she's only going to produce colostrum, mm -hmm. what we call colostrum, a few drops at a time. She's not going to produce milk, mm -hmm. but sometimes in the hospital, some people will show the mother and convince her that your breast is not producing milk. Mm -hmm. So let's give your baby formula. And they end up with the formula. Yes, but <coughs> the breast was not supposed to produce mm -hmm. milk on the first day. It was supposed to produce drops of brownish, light brown colostrum, which is highly concentrated, high calorie, high antibodies and everything. That's all the baby needs. And physicians the act as if they don't know that is. Uh, <coughs> I, I believe that physicians know a little bit about breastfeeding, but in the last 40, mm -hmm. 30 years, 
breastfeeding has been removed from the curriculum. Mm -hmm. They might, in the medical school, in the nursing school, they might mention breast milk mm -hmm. and then go on and talk about mm -hmm. formula. Mm -hmm. But now we have people called certified lactation consultants mm -hmm. in the hospital. They are trained. They are trained to give proper and full breastfeeding mm -hmm. education. But that's not enough. We want every doctor, and every nurse mm -hmm. to be trained. Everybody, mm -hmm. not just a few. And so in my program, I try to talk to these mothers and I tell them, make sure you tell your doctor you want mm -hmm. to breastfeed so that they will refer you to the lactation consultant mm -hmm. so that you will know all there is to know about breastfeeding your baby. Now, what if somebody would like to know more about uh, what you're doing, doctor, in terms of your research and your program and et cetera? Uh, what, what can you leave with us this morning in reference well, to how they could get in touch with you? I have a phone number. Mm -hmm. They can call us at 615 mm -hmm. 327-5670. Or they can get in touch with you at Meharry Medical yes, College. Yes, I'm right there at Meharry if mm. they ask for mm. Dr. Yukoli. Yukoli. And they mm. say the, the pregnant breast, women. Yeah, the breastfeeding <laughs> pregnant baby woman. woman. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Program, <coughs> they can get to me. We, uh -huh. So I'm, I'm right there. But, and, and so you truly believe that this can really change the lives of it mothers will, and children? Because because I was there in Nigeria when we started the Baby Friendly Initiative in 1990. Mm. And it was like night and day. One day we were not mm. breastfeeding and the next day we were breastfeeding. Mm. The whole country. Mm -hmm. Because we became baby friendly. Mm -hmm. In 1990. And so that's Nigeria now in terms of baby Nigeria and, and many, milk. many, many other uh -huh. countries. America is becoming baby friendly from about six years ago. Uh -huh. And in Nashville, a few hospitals are now baby friendly. Uh -huh. Two hospitals uh -huh. are Very baby Very good. Friendly. And Dr. Okoli, let me, uh, well, thank you for coming by and giving us that excellent information in reference <laughs> to uh, preventing overweight uh, babies. And I think that it goes a long way in terms of helping to deal with many of the uh, problems that we have dealing with infant health. And I want to pr tell you how much we appreciate you. And let me encourage you to tune in again next week to another informative edition of Comments. Thank you and good morning.
Thank you and welcome to the show this morning. The topic this morning is the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People and Quality Education. And we have to uh, talk to us, uh, dealing with uh, the uh, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, Pastor Kay Walker, uh, Ms. Eric Lanier, and uh, Mr. Preston uh, Stewart. And of course, uh, Pastor Walker, let's have you to uh, introduce uh, Ms. Lanier and uh, Mr. Stewart to our audience this morning, and then we'll have an opportunity to talk to them about certain things. Okay. But first, introduce them to uh, us as well as our audience. Okay, well, first of all, and I guess I should say first and foremost, Dr. Mm -hmm. Haney, I want to thank you for the opportunity to come on mm -hmm. your show once again to talk about some of the things that's very important uh, to our community as well, and to basically let people know and keep people informed of the fact that the NAACP is actively involved in doing some things in terms of our community. Uh, who we have here today with us is uh, the chair, co-chairs of the Educational Committee, Ms. Erica Lanier and Mr. Preston Stewart, and they're really, really uh, on the battlefield laboring uh, intensely to bring about some changes and to address some issues and concerns that's happening in the school system. Very good. Mr. Lanier, why don't you give us some information about your background, your education, and some of the things that were important in terms of bringing you to us this morning, and we'll have Mr. Stewart to do essentially the same kind of information, and we'll be able to shut out this uh, first segment of the show for today. Okay. Uh, my name is Erica Lanier. I am a native Nashvilleian a proud product of Metro Nashville Public Schools, so I know how phenomenal they can be. Um, I'm also an even prouder graduate of Tennessee State University and a former student of yourself. And um, I guess my passion um, for education stems from my two most precious investments being my children and starting off learning the system, learning how to properly advocate for them and since that passion has grown to service all 84,000 of our other students. Very good, Mrs. Stewart. Uh, I'm <laughs> Preston Stewart, and I'm a graduate of Tennessee State University, with a master's, a double master's in psychology and counseling. I'm a retired uh, psychologist and counselor from the Cincinnati Public Schools mm -hmm. with 36 years of experience uh, as a teacher uh, special education teacher, character education teacher, also as a special education inclusion specialist. And uh, my passion is about uh, trying to uh, get education on target. Mm -hmm. 
But Pastor Walker, you know, we, when we talk about uh, the National Association and for the Advancement of Colored People and quality education, exactly what are we talking about? Well, uh, for a long time, you know, here, especially locally, the local branch of NAACP, been kind of getting a bad knock because a lot of times people are not seeing how involved we are in the educational system mm -hmm. and how involved we are in other areas as well. But, but what we're trying to do here is highlight some of the things that we're actually involved in, what we're pursuing in the NAACP Educational com uh, Committee in terms of what's going on in our public school system. Mm -hmm. You know, Dr. Haney, you and I, we've sat here in this same setting and we've talked before about education in Tennessee and the school system and, and public education. But today, there's a difference because now we've got some experts in this thing. Yeah, somebody <laughs> that knows something about what we're talking <laughs> yes, about. Sir. Very good. Yes, sir. And of course, Mr. Lanier, why don't you uh, give us some statements in reference to uh, uh, what you consider to be when we talk about quality in, uh, edu in, in education, public education. Um, when I think of quality, and I think um, above all else, it is a level playing field for all of our students. It's a culture that communicates to all children that they can all learn, and that we expect and set high expectations for all of them, regardless to their social economic background, um, regardless to religion, regardless to any of the numerous factors to where our children are unfortunately sometimes being discouraged and told that they can't. Mm -hmm. um, so something that I always tell my children and sometimes the children that I've inherited over the years through helping mm -hmm. is let your haters be your motivators. Mm -hmm. You can do and it is up to you to be a success. In other words, we can create our own quality if we so desire. And, and, and so that's one of the things that you uh, want to talk about this morning and to uh, sort of give us some additional information. And of course, Mr. Seward, we're just about uh, ready for our first commercial break. But what we want to do uh, during this uh, end of this segment is to uh, have you to know that when we come back, we're going to call upon you and you can start us off doing this uh, second segment, uh, giving us not only some information in reference to your background, education, and experiences, but to begin with uh, what we talk about when we talk about quality education in the NAACP. And of course, we'll be back with our audience following this very, very short commercial break. Thank you and welcome back to the second segment of the show for today. We're talking to Pastor Kay Walker, Miss Erica Lanier, and uh, Mr. Preston Stewart. And uh, Mr. Stewart, I think we promised that uh, we would give you an opportunity to give us some information in reference to your background, education, and whatever. And I think that some of the things that you've already said has uh, indicated to me that uh, we've gone to some of the same places, Ohio and uh, mm -hmm. Tennessee State and et cetera. And Miss uh, uh, Erica uh, Lanier has also indicated uh, uh, that she somehow knew me at an earlier period <laughs> somehow, and I remember her face and I know exactly who she is now. Yes. But Mr. Stewart, let's see if we can uh, have you to give us some information about your background, education, and some of your experiences. And then uh, we'll move to uh, Miss uh, Lanier and she'll talk about exceptional education. Uh, in my experience in the uh, Cincinnati Public Schools, I have uh, found and I have been very concerned in regards to young people taking full advantage of the education. And uh, I'm a little bit uh, concerned and very passionate about the lack of achievement, uh, the uh, uh, certain kinds of behavior that's non-productive within the school system and trying to devise methods to counteract that sort of thing, where we will not have the high suspension rates that we have, 
in order to try to do some programs of prevention. And, uh, and this is what I've been most passionate about, where young people can take education seriously. And I feel that our education system has got some way to sell education to young people to the standpoint that they'll have a different kind of behavior in school and realize that they have to try to promote themselves to their greatest ability. In other words, Mr. Lanier, we should move toward what you consider to be what exception in education, exceptional education. Talk about that for a while for us. Um, well, our district two years ago um, actually coined the phrase exceptional education as a politically correct replacement for special education mm -hmm. because the um, rainbow um, per se uh, extended in terms of what students could actually receive uh, services um, for education. Um, but I think that regardless to what the diagnosis is, um, knowledge is power. So one thing that we're focusing on now is also doing a per se ex exceptional education training and opening it up, um, not beyond the general membership of the NAACP, but to the community as a whole for parents um, and caregivers of children to understand what exceptional education is, what legal protections they have for their children, and what the proper way is to advocate. Um, and we have a series of books through a lot of community partners that have gotten together and I'd like to take this opportunity to present this to you on behalf of the Education Committee for the NAACP. Um, but I, I think our biggest thing is each one teach one mm -hmm. so that there's always someone there to continue the fight for our students mm -hmm. because sadly, as Mr. Stewart said, if we don't reach them now, they will end up in the penal system later. Mm -hmm. And so the NAACP is doing quite a bit in terms of education. As a matter of fact, we've had uh, a number of other people from that, mm -hmm. uh, their, that same committee. Now, what about parental involvement in education as far as the NAACP is concerned? Well, definitely, the, the, you know, parental involvement is definitely important, Dr. Mm -hmm. Haney. That's the, really, that's the starting point because when you birth a child into the world, you should naturally teach and train your child. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing I like about what Mr. Stewart talks about, he talks in terms of character education mm -hmm. and, and, and it relates as to how a child acts at the home in their environment away from the school as opposed to how they should act within the school mm -hmm. system and that training should be provided. Of course, he can elaborate even further mm -hmm. on that particular uh, method because he's actually taught it himself. Mm -hmm. So, of course, he, he knows more about that than I do. Well, they, we call that character education. Is that right, Mr. Stewart? Yes. Well, that, explain that, that to us. You've got about two minutes. Uh, well, uh, it's wherein <laughs> that you get uh, young people to buy into being honest, uh, being diligent. And uh, I don't see evidence of that in the school setting. Mm -hmm. We have to realize that children come from different worlds mm -hmm. in the community. They come from uh, the, the, uh, the home world where they have to learn different types of uh, behaviors to survive. They come from different neighborhoods where they have to learn different types of behaviors to survive. And so when they come to the school, they don't realize there's a different type of behavior that you have to survive in school and to be able to uh, develop yourself to your fullest ability. So therefore, that behavior doesn't coincide and make a matriculation in school uh, a compatible. So therefore, we have a high rate of suspension because that behavior that they use in the other two worlds doesn't work in the school. So we've got to sell a in-school type of behavior so that the child can proceed in a way that he can achieve like he should. And I think that's the reason why our achievement scores are, are low. This is why we're having now the, the common core debate as to whether we should do that or not. If students buy into education and you connect it to the economics of them, every student, even though we got 75% of them that are disadvantaged, the more disadvantaged a student is, the more he's inclined to realize that almighty dollar. They must be told and, and preached to and uplift mm -hmm. and inspired in school uh, to the standpoint that they buy into education, to the standpoint that they do their very best. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, we, uh, as far as the character education, we can use those particular personality qualities, honesty, mm -hmm. compassion, kindness. You are tomorrow's America. Our young people have to realize that each one of us are gonna retire. Mm -hmm. Some young person is gonna take 
everybody's place, mm -hmm. all the lawyers, all the doctors, all the nurses, and make them aware that they are tomorrow's America and that the way that they take an attitude in school as far as how their behavior is mm -hmm. determines directly and proportional how successful they're going to be as adults. So, mm -hmm. Mr. Lanier, you think that uh, <clears throat> these books sort of represent what you're trying to, uh, you and others are trying to promote throughout the uh, metropolitan school system. We've got about a minute. Make some statements. Uh, reference to that. Definitely, because we have parents who do not know their rights, do not know that they have rights. Um, they trust that what the school tells them is Bible. And it truly does, to be successful, take a village to raise a child. So you have to have that active participation from all parties, and all parties have to buy into the fact that this child can be and is a, going to be a success story, not a statistic. And all of those things sort of boil down to, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, what the NAACP is doing to bring about quality in education, not only, uh, well, throughout all of the uh, metropolitan school sy uh, system. Is that what we're saying? Yes, sir. Very good. And, of course, we'll be back. We're going to take our uh, second commercial break, and we'll be back with our audience.